This is ready to be spread now by okay. Follow up. Yeah. Mr. Chair. Hi, the city engineer. In modifying that role, did you uh, uh, take did you assess that lot as one lot or divide the uh, assessment into two, as we discussed last week? Uh, we we assessed it as one lot. We assessed it as, as if there was no split. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Colorado. Right. Unanimous. My direct question to attorney. Mr. Attorney, have we pursued the uh, possibility of filing an action on that illegal split? I think it was directed by the council last time, or at least I suggested I don't have any present recollection, Your Honor. I'll find out. Thank you. Item 105 continues in the meeting of September the 27th. <clears throat> this is the appeal of Mr. Raymond Kelman from the decision of the Chief of Police denying his application for a cardinal license at 4202 National Avenue. The hearing is open. Testimony was taken. De Kirby, Morrow, and Curran were absent. Mr. Kelman here. Mr. Kellen? Oh, I think that the, uh, pardon me, Mr. Sarp, I think the council asked for a report and the manager has it. Okay. Yes, I submitted to the council yesterday uh, some additional information that you had asked for. I uh, recall the council asked uh, what criteria is used by the police department, police re regulated businesses. Uh, a rather complete report has been given to the council indicating the various methods that we use for making the investigations. The question was asked, are there any other investigations in which financial stability was an issue and used in one of the criteria? The report points out that one other is, uh, is used that way, which is the pawnbroker operation. The uh, council also asked, uh, how often have we denied a card room license in which financial insolvency was a key or a major factor? I have a report from the police department uh, listing seven such which were denied. Uh, in which financial insolvency was one of the issues used, and this goes back to 1962. There was two in 1962, there were four in 1964, and one in 1965. Question, Council? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, at the outset, I'd like to say that it's a real honor to have the opportunity to be the last person to formally disagree with our outgoing city manager, Tom Fletcher. With the exception of the mayor and, and Marge Fletcher, I think I've had the opportunity to disagree with him more often than anybody in this room. And he usually would come out on top. I remember our first Donnie Brook on the traffic light at Spring Street and Claremont Mesa Boulevard. I think I won that one, but he won most of the others. He won at the next election. How'd you do with the sanitary fill, right? <laughs> Not so well. <laughs> I assume the council has had an opportunity to read the um, supplemental report. Um, we, of course, disagree with it. Um, we honestly don't believe that there is or should be any connection between a person's uh, monetary status or their financial ability and their propensity to crime. The chief indicates that Mr. Kelman, because he has financial difficulties, might engage in illegal activities such as bookmaking, peddling narcotics, or procuring ladies of the night. And we submit that there is no relationship whatsoever between these uh, two, two conditions. If the city attorney will read the report, uh, this is referred to in the last paragraph. We think that this is ludicrous. We think it's unfair. The fact that this man is not John D. Rockefeller is not a sufficient basis for intimating that he's going to become a criminal. This is a police regulated business. If he were going to become a bookie or a dope peddler or the other word used by the chief, we submit that he would not be down here asking for a license to go into a business where he is under the con constant scrutiny of the vice squad. If he were going to do these things, he would do them. They, we submit there's no connection. There are other police regulated businesses, <coughs> 41 to be exact, which are listed on page 3. None of them require any financial um, analysis or any financial stability. 
except that of a pawnbroker, and rightfully so. A pawnbroker, of course, is handling other person's property and money, and the financial stability of that person should be uh, closely inquired into. In the card room business, which is a properly uh, regulated business in the city of San Diego, the operator does not handle anyone's money. All he does is rent a space at a table for 80 cents an hour. He is taking money from the patron. He is not handling the patron's money. We submit that, that it is unfair to uh, deprive this man the right to go into a legitimate business in the city of San Diego merely because he has a bad debt record. If that is the case, we submit that the chief or the manager should go one step further and revoke the licenses of all of those who do have a permit who later fall into financial difficulties. That, of course, would be illogical, but, but we think that the first step is equally illogical. <coughs> Mr. Kelman admittedly has a bad debt record. Mr. Scheidel pointed out that it has endured over a period of 15 years. The first five were attributable to debts which his wife ran up when he was in the Army between 51 and 56. This has happened to many people. When he was overseas, his wife uh, bought too many clothes. Does that mean that because he had a, an unhappy marital arrangement or financial arrangement with his former wife that he should not be permitted to go into business? The other debts arose when he was unemployed between 56 and 57 uh, when there was a shutdown in the aircraft industry. He cannot explain away all of these debts. The debts are there. He could wipe them out and be dishonorable about it, but he has not taken the dishonorable route of bankruptcy. If he were to go through bankruptcy and have a clean credit record, then would he be given a permit? We feel it is basically unfair to de deprive him this permit merely because of this bad debt record. He has an excellent service record with the uh, Navy Civil Service at North Island where he has been employed for five years. He has a four-year service record from Convair and a four-year service record from Ryan Aeronautical. He has never been dismissed from his job. He has a letter of reference here from his uh, preacher down at the Calvary Baptist Church, Reverend Marvin C. Hines, which I would like to read, if I may, Your Honor. Gentlemen, <coughs> I am writing in regards to Mr. Raymond Kelman. I have known Mr. Kelman for a number of years, and I am writing this letter in support of his wishes to receive a, a business license. Mr. Kelman is an honest and very dependable person. Through the years, he has worked very hard, and I know he is a very capable man. I feel that all consideration should be given him in regards to his license, for his livelihood depends upon it. This is his wish, and he does have the ability and the intense interest to carry through with them. Respectfully, yours, Reverend Marvin C. Hines, 4166 National Avenue. I think it is unfair, as I'll say in conclusion and be a bit repetitious about it, that it is unfair to deprive him the opportunity to earn a living in his chosen profession uh, merely because he has this bad debt record. We ask your favorable consideration. Thank you, Mr. Sir. Mr. Cochran here. Mr. Cochran, is it the, usually the, is it a usual procedure of the police department after a license has been issued to pick it up for a bad, bad uh, payment record? Your Honor, this probably wouldn't come to our attention. Uh, we have on occasion had uh, uh, owners come in and make the statement that I want to turn in my card room license, I'm in financial difficulties, and I, I just can't survive, and they just surrender them. We've never revoked one for that reason. Question? Mr. Walsh? Uh, my understanding is this individual has had financial problems for a period of time, starting in 1951. Uh, do we have any records of violations or uh, any criminal offenses during that period of time when uh, financially depressed has this individual resorted to during waiters of the night and some of these other things that have been mentioned here as an affliction of those with financial difficulties? The record that is, has been made available to us, uh, if you wish me to give it, uh, is not particularly bad. It's uh, 1953, uh, a dismissed charge from the L.A. Police Department on assault with a deadly weapon. Um, from 53 to 61, 
subsequently arrested seven times by the police department on traffic charges for violations amounting to two warrants, five warrants, and 15 warrants. Three and 61, the uh, sheriff's department uh, also arrested subject on traffic charges. So it's been, other than the one dismissed one, it's been traffic charges. My, uh, the trust, uh, my feeling in this uh, matter is the fact that uh, we do have an application for a business license. We do have a background which uh, indicates even under financial duress that the individual has really not resorted to some of the things that might be the temptations as indicated here if he did operate the business. Secondly, the point that, uh, that we do not go back and, and have periodical or annual uh, inventories of the individuals who have these licenses as far as the financial stability uh, indicates to me that uh, uh, that we really can't place that much weight on the fact that when an, an individual is taking out a license uh, that his financial background should have that great a weight that if these other problems could arise out of financial difficulties then I think our concern uh, would uh, be enough incentive for us to go ahead and to hold periodic checks as far as financial uh, uh, responsibility. And since we don't do this, I think it's an indication that uh, uh, that possibly we shouldn't place that type of weight in regards to issuing a license. I think we have an individual here from either from his church record and from his employment record indicates a stable enough uh, uh, background that uh, he should be afforded the opportunity uh, to go into to business and. Uh, uh, unless we're going to say that we're totally against card room uh, licenses and so on, I think that uh, uh, really that this is not a, a sound basis on which we could turn down a permit as long as we recognize the business. Question to the attorney. I noticed the annotation on the side here saying Mr. DeCreary, Mr. Morrow, and myself have been absent during testimony. This precludes us from voting on this. Your Honor, provided that you come up to date on the testimony that may have been taken at the previous hearing, which, as I recall, was not significant in its terms, uh, there'd be no objection to your voting on it. My recollection of that hearing is that there was before the Council then an initial report from the Chief of Police dated September 23rd that questions were asked which resulted in the further report given by the manager this morning that as we went along, it was brought up that we had failed to furnish the appellant with the detailed uh, reports of one kind or another, and the matter was continued for two weeks to enable Mr. Tharp and the appellant to to get on top. Would it be your position, Mr. Tharp, that uh, that's a fair statement of what took place at the last hearing? Yes. And provided, Your Honor, that you do look at the 23rd, the September 23rd report from the chief uh, to the manager, we would feel that you've been brought up to date on what did transpire at the first hearing and you would be qualified to vote on the matter now. Ms. Uh, Gunn? The, the fact that this, uh, these, and I presume these are moving violations, uh, uh, are not continued here after 1961, does it mean that there have been no more arrests? Not in, it does, does not indicate whether there have been any more moving violations. The information provided me was the last of 61. I do not have any evidence of any additional consent. I presume if there had been arrests after 61, they would have been on that team. Uh, just one other thing that concerns me, I'm not sure whether it should or not, is that uh, the last of these uh, on the uh, supplemental investigation sheet is fairly recent, and I'm a little unsure in my own mind. Um, I, doesn't it take an amount of cash in order to start any business, including card rooms? And if, in fact, the cash is not available for the bills, I'm sort of wondering how we're going to get into business. The council may recall that uh, in my report of September 23rd, it was pointed out that the police department uh, offered the appellant, or the applicant, an opportunity to present to the police department uh, a current financial status report indicating what are his current debts, his liabilities, his income, projections. And upon the receiving of that up-to-date financial information, we agreed to reconsider his application. Uh, the applicant in this case did not furnish it, and still, to my knowledge, has not furnished us with that financial information that we asked for. Thank so I would be, un it would be at this moment, we would be unable to answer that particular question. Mr. Then, as of this morning, there is no financial statement been presented. That is correct. Yes, statement, Mr. Sir. 
Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Kelman went to a public accountant and asked that he prepare a financial statement, and the charge was to be $60. Uh, Mr. Kelman doesn't have the $60 to invest in a financial statement, merely to submit um, for review purposes. And it is our position that it is not the prerogative of the police department to inquire or to demand of him a financial statement. A financial statement is not required of any of the other 41 police regulated businesses except for the pawnbroker who handles other people's money. Is he any less likely a good citizen or an honest citizen than one who operates a carnival or a dance hall or a wrecking yard or a bowling alley? If it is not required of these other businesses, why should Mr. Kelman have to cough up $60 for a financial report? Yes, I uh, I would assume uh, that uh, the police regulated <laughs> businesses are regulated because uh, it's uh, a more sensitive business. It also appears to me that in many of the businesses of this type that are borderline that go in and out uh, as their society swings back and forth, uh, whether it be liquor or gambling, and uh, uh, it's in, in the liquor industry, they must supply financial information. They must uh, have a clear police record. Uh, now, to the point of this gentleman, ac accepting responsibility, uh, I can see how anyone can run into an unfortunate situation uh, with his first marriage. Uh, uh, but as I continue down the line here, I see both in his financial arrangements uh, from 1962 on and, and up through 1966 uh, that he is not willing to stand up to the obligations that he agrees to. Uh, uh, this concerns me. Now, uh, uh, as to the point that Mr. Walsh made, uh, uh, that merely because we do not go back and investigate other businesses uh, uh, after they're in business, uh, uh, I know this does happen in the other areas, maybe not in the city, uh, it would seem to me that maybe this is something we, we should look into, but just because we may or may not be doing our job in another area uh, that we haven't looked at in established policy, why, uh, this is no reason to open the door. Uh, and frankly, uh, I would hesitate to recommend a person with this sort of <coughs> police record, uh, when I say police record, even if it's a traffic citation, it's intent to conform to the law or not. Uh, also, in the uh, uh, in the financial end of it, uh, uh, I honestly uh, uh, think it would be uh, starting a, a rather bad precedent, and uh, we're going to make mistakes from time to time. And when we do, I don't think they should be pointed back to as reasons for allowing more of the same. Uh, I would be opposed to uh, granting this license. Mr. Hitch, well, Your Honor, I can think back uh, a few times. When I uh, started in business with a lack of uh, sufficient capital, undercapitalized, had I not been given a chance, I wouldn't have had an opportunity to uh, progress. And uh, I feel like uh, from what Mr. Tharp has said, uh, that if this young fellow is given a chance, and he certainly would take into consideration all of the things that have been said by members of the council, I would uh, like to make the motion to grant the appeal and uh, award the card room license to Mr. Kelton. Kel Kelman. Schaefer. I'd like to second that, but I had a couple of comments. I, I, I'm not really that opposed to the furnishing of a financial statement, but I think a financial statement should, could just be a little simple, simple memory graph form that the man would fill out and sign. I don't think we have to require auditors and accountants and everybody else to get into it. I think if it's a simple statement like you and I fill out every time we go in to borrow $25 from the bank. Uh, I noticed here on his place record we have to go back 13 years to find anything that is of a real penal nature, and that was dismissed. Uh, we have to go back five and a half years to find a traffic ticket. Uh, we can go back three years on myself and find that I went to a red light or something. I think this man has a, has a good traffic record. I'm impressed by the child support payment that he appears to have been made to date. I don't see any records for lack of support of his child, which is $50 a month and the fact that he's only run up about $500 in debts over a five-year period. Most people that are out trying to take advantage of 
uh, the commercial world can run up $500 worth of debts overnight if they want to. So I think he's been, been at least moderate in his debt obligation. And uh, I second Mr. Hitch's motion. Just a brief comment, Your, your Honor. I, I think basically we're looking, uh, we're trying to determine here whether the man, man has the character to, to uh, be granted this license. Um, uh, as our record shows, it has been a number of years. Uh, as, uh, the, uh, he's not an old man. He's still a young man, and I'm sure uh, <coughs> uh, character changes rapidly from young man into to uh, as, as they grow older. But uh, the, when we're talking about, about the uh, financial status, it just sort of reminds me that uh, people, of course, uh, this man may not be like these people, but uh, like J.C. Penney and Woolworth, these people actually filed bankruptcy. Uh, I think a great many people started, uh, uh, let's say, uh, in, uh, with uh, very little funds and in great debt when they gone and did it. Uh, with the debts that uh, this man has incurred, I, I would think that if he has a foresight and the uh, ambition to try to go in business and make up these debts and uh, into an area that he knows that he's familiar with, I, I think we should uh, grant him the license so long as his character, we feel that his character merits it. Not so much that the financial background should uh, cloudy the issue. Now, if this is in my district. It's on 4200 block in National. If, uh, if, if any anything that would jeopardize the good name of, uh, let's say, the card room business, I, I personally would use my influence, what influence I can use, uh, to see that the license would be revoked. And uh, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, basically, we, we should grant this license and uh, uh, the police department, because of this, because it has come to us, I'm sure the police department would keep a, let's say, a closer watch on this particular business and uh, if anything should come up, we would be aware of it. <coughs> Mr. Ross? Your Honor, I, I think the question of whether or not Mr. Kelman gets his license today is important to Mr. Kelman, and I, I think that the greater thing that we're overlooking, I think, is the philosophy involved here. The thing that concerns me is in the approval or disapproval of the license, what standards do we have to apply? Now, I heard mention a requirement of a certified auditor, whether or not that was a requirement or not, I'm not really sure. But the philosophy involved here is, should or should not the city of San Diego uh, has as a requirement a financial uh, uh, statement of an individual applying for licenses, and if so, which licenses should they be required for? And number two, to what extent should this uh, financial statement uh, uh, cover? And I don't think that we sufficiently spelled out the standards and so on by which, number one, we define which businesses will require a financial statement, and number two, the type of financial statement that is required. And so for this reason, I, I think that uh, as one individual and so on, I think it's improper for us to make up the type of financial statement that we go up, to make the rules of the standards and so on if they're not spelled out as we go into these hearings. And so for this reason, I think that in our consideration today, we should dismiss the requirement in regards to the financial statement until this council establishes that one of the requirements for a card room license is a financial statement is required, certified by an auditor, or whatever financial requirements we do spell out. We haven't done it, and we bring it up in these hearings. Now, we are delegating to the manager's office the authority to approve a license, but consequential, or rather in conjunction with that, we also should be required to spell out the standards by which they either approve or disapprove these. And I don't think that we've adequately done this. And I would say that after this hearing, uh, and as I've already spoken in favor of it, that we refer the card room license to a council conference, number one, to spell out the standards by which they would be approved, to get a briefing from the manager in regard to the problems that have arisen and so on in the past. And also the other thing I think we should review is the annual charges and in regards to, uh, to the business license for these establishments, because I continually hear of the amount of police supervision that's required. And yet in our business license fees and our mayor's committees and our finance committees and so on, reviewing city services and charges comp uh, compensatory to what they actually cost us, I see very little of this reflected in the charges that we have for business licenses today. If we do have all of this supervision, I think it's about time possibly we look at this again. Mr. Meyer? 
Well, this is primarily the <coughs> criteria. I, I don't see that we've really established one in the past, and I was going to suggest that we do. Perhaps in the financial area, the criteria be that a man has gone broke at least three or four times because then he knows what it's all about. And based on statistics, at least, you've got the fact that uh, most first-generation millionaires have been bankrupt three or four times. So I really wonder about the traffic tickets and all this, and I would uh, concur that we need some sort of criteria based on rather character reference rather than uh, some of these other rather nebulous things. Question on the motion. <clears throat> so there's no misunderstanding of my vote. I am in support of the police department, with or without criteria, in relation to policing a very sensitive area that has been pointed out here. And criteria is not going to be spelled out now or at any time. And the only possible way to solve this problem is the elimination of card rooms, period. Call roll. Oh, Your Honor. Your Honor. Call Your Honor. Yes. I'd like to speak to what you said. Mr. Hitch, everyone on the council has had an opportunity to speak. It was my turn. Call or roll. Your Honor, would you... We have a new policy. Well, I, I, I think that the, we don't know what you're going to say. My vote for this card room license, I want the opportunity to say that it does not mean that we do not support the police department. Uh, uh, it's according to the criteria set up, a man has the right to appeal to the council. And uh, so we're exercising our judgment, or at least I feel I am mine, and not opposing the police department. I think it's wrong for the mayor to cast off in the role of the villains or heralds by his comments, and I am for the police department too. Ms. Cutler. Could I ask a restatement of the motion, please? Motion. I didn't hear a second to Mr. Hitch's. Was it seconded? Yes, it was, uh, it was seconded. And his motion is to... Mr. Schaefer, uh, Mr. Hitch made the motion, Mr. Schaefer made the second. And it is to grant the appeal? Right. <coughs> Call up. By a majority vote of the council, the appeal has been granted. Districts 1, 3, and the chair voting no. Balance of the council voting yes. Right. Item 106 on the docket. Paving and otherwise improving Kenwood Street, 60th Street, and Wonderland Avenue. This is on the confirmation of the assessment. We have one appeal. Anyone in the audience wish to be heard on item 106? Point of information, Your Honor. Mr. Walsh. Are you going to speak to item 106? Depending on what you say, sir. <laughs> I have the same prerogatives that the council has, I think. And oh, that's to make a, a make a political and public statement at all. Right. And I was just wondering whether or not we had the, the same uh, authority also to determine when we can speak last. I, there's a lot of times I'd like to use it. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is the prerogative of the chair. Anyone in the audience who wish to speak on item 106? I move we close the hearing and adopt the resolution confirming the assessment. Second. The nature of the appeal, Mr. Clerk. We have one protest, uh, cost and benefit. Oh, it should be included. Overrule it. Overrule the protest. Motion to overrule the protest and confirm the assessment. Call it. It's unanimous. Pardon? We can be finished in five minutes. We can wait. Okay, call roll. All right. <laughs> be a five minute read. Mr. Clerk, set the timer. <laughs>
Clerk, call the roll, please. Copy Kirby Shuttle, Hom, Morrow, Walsh, Hitch, Schaefer, Kern. Item 107, the Pacific Beach Lighting Operating District Number 1 on the assessment. Anyone in the audience wish to be heard on item 107? Motion to close the hearing, confirm the assessment. Motion to close the hearing, confirm the assessment, award the contract, call her off. It's unanimous. Oh. Repoll the <laughs> color. And a little discrepancy. It's unanimous. <laughs> Item 108. Ocean Beach Street Lighting Operating District, number one. On the assessment. Anyone in the audience wish to be heard on the item 108? <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Close the hearing, confirm the assessment, or the contract. Right. All are off. Unanimous. Item 109, the University Avenue Street Lighting Operating District 1. Anyone in the audience wish to be heard on item 109? Honorable, we close the hearing, adopt the resolution confirming the assessment and awarding the contract. Right. All are off. Unanimous. Under communications, only the individual or a designated representative of a group submitting a letter will speak to communication. These items are not subject to debate by members of the audience. Item 110, Jim Hewitt requesting joint city court district participation in the study to determine the feasibility of establishment of an oceanog oceanic research industrial park. Mr. Hewitt. Mr. Mayor and members of the council, my name is James O. Hewitt. And I'm here as the chairman of the newly formed San Diego Oceanic Coordinating Committee. And if I may, I would like to give you just a very brief background of this committee. Uh, it's been in its formative stages now for the last two months. Uh, the idea was conceived by Mr. Joseph Sanat, who is president of the Chamber of Commerce, who on the 4th of August called together representatives of six major agencies in San Diego including the City of San Diego, the Unified Port District, the Chamber of Commerce, the 200th Anniversary Committee, uh, the EDC, Economic Development Corporation, and San Diego Inc. Uh, from that meeting, the present date, uh, we have embarked upon a program to create a policy-making committee for the creation in San Diego uh, of San Diego being the oceanic capital of the world. And as you know, there's been a lot of talk about this, there's been a lot of publicity about this, but so far most of it has been merely talk. Uh, I might say that the basic purpose of this committee would be the joint pooling of information uh, and plans to achieve the maximum effectiveness in the development of oceanic activities and industry and the attraction of oceanic activities here in San Diego. Uh, each agency would be, uh, the ones that I've mentioned in the policy making committee, uh, would be represented on the coordinating committee by a single designee. Uh, Mr. Douglas McElfrish, uh, chairman of the Port Commissioners, will represent the Unified Port District of San Diego. Uh, Mr. Hamilton Marston, president of San Diego Zinc, will represent San Diego Zinc. Mr. Herbert Solomon, an attorney, will represent the Economic Development Corporation. Uh, Mr. Greer Ferber, an engineer, will represent the 200th Anniversary, Inc. Uh, Mr. Kimball Moore, who has been or is an assistant uh, to the city manager, uh, has acted as the city's representative on an interim basis uh, during the formative stages uh, of the committee, and I represent the San Diego Chamber of Commerce. Uh, the coordinating committee's primary work will be just that, coordinating uh, all aspects of ocean-oriented uh, development uh, towards the end, as I said, of truly making San Diego the oceanic capital of the world and not merely talking about it. Uh, I'm sure all of you are aware that uh, Hawaii and Long Beach and Seattle all have laid claims recently to being the oceanic capital of the world. Uh, while we scoff at these claims, I think that it's necessary that we recognize the uh, tremendous and rapid advancement in oceanics by each of these geographical areas. Uh, in fact, the aggressiveness has reached the point of even attempting to entice away uh, San Diego-based uh, industry uh, in the oceanic area. Many of our local organizations have received letters from Seattle, and particularly uh, 
and trying to entice them away on the basis of uh, no property taxes for a period of time or low rent or uh, low priced industrial land. Now, uh, the, com the coordinating committee, I might say, as you can recognize, is composed of lay personnel, certainly in the field of oceanics. Uh, because of this, we have formed and are in the stages of forming a what we consider a highly fortified uh, blue ribbon uh, committee of technical advisors, which will be referred to as the Technical Advisory Committee. Uh, it will be uh, participated on by groups such as Scripps Institute of Oceanography, Dr. Nuremberg. Uh, we met with him about uh, a week or 10 days ago, and also with Representative Van Derlin, who's very interested in this project, and also Bob Wilson. He, although Mr. Wilson wasn't at the meeting, uh, he wants to be kept apprised of what we were doing. Uh, Dr. Nuremberg indicated that he will very shortly assign a member of his staff uh, to uh, the advisory committee. Other organizations which we intend to have on the technical advisory committee would include the Naval Electronics Laboratory, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, possibly the State Resources Committee. Hugo Fisher has indicated a sincere interest in working closely with us in this regard and certainly any and all educational institutions who are also interested. Uh, the purpose of my appearance uh, here is to formally invite the city of San Diego to participate as a member of the Oceanic Coordinating Committee. Uh, furthermore, I would request that the council authorize a representative to serve on the committee. On the committee. And finally, uh, I would ask that the council authorize the planning department staff and possibly any other personnel that from time to time may be necessary to work jointly with the Unified Port District toward the following two ends. First, in investigating and inventorying all possible lands in San Diego which have potential use for ocean-oriented industry and research. And second, to participate in a planning study of waterfront and backup lands leading toward the creation of an ocean-oriented research industrial park. Now, we have, certainly the committee has completely open minds as to any particular land. There's been a lot of locations in San Diego bannered about by various groups from time to time, but there is uh, at this time certainly uh, no thought in any of our minds as to what particular parcel or parcel should be used for this purpose. And we could only make this determination, of course, after the joint study between the city and the Unified Port District has been concluded. Now, to the extent that I can, I'd be happy to answer any questions that any of you may have. Uh, this is listed under communications on the docket, and we don't normally get into discussion on this, but I would suggest that it would be proper for the council and management uh, to, knowing of, of your request, to prepare for a conference at which time we can sit down and discuss with you or with the other members of, the, of your group the ramifications of getting in, into this. I think it's highly desirable, but uh, I think we ought to have a conference. Ms. Shannon? Uh, Your Honor, uh, I agree that we should have a conference on this. However, uh, I think it's also property that we have some questions because uh, this is to eliminate auto audience participation. Uh, I think the idea is tremendous. However, I have one question. Uh, the <coughs> groups that are involved here uh, certainly are city and county wide in interest, with one exception. And I'm very curious as to the reason for San Diegans Incorporated being in this group because it would appear to me that there are going to be other planning areas other than downtown San Diego, which is their area that they're interested in, uh, such as the southeast San Diego along the port and so forth. And I, I would Quite like to have some reasons or, or logic or justification why they are there and not the rest of the ink groups as well, or an elimination of the ink groups. There must be a reason. I don't know what it is. Uh, Mr. Shiloh, if I may, uh, the reason the San Diegans Inc. Uh, was included is because they had embarked themselves uh, upon a study of the possible uses of, of below Broadway properties for this type of purpose for oceanic industries. Uh, the committee is intended to be fluid so that it can contain and will contain from time to time uh, any organization or organization of interest that are working towards the same goal. It's not restricted uh, to these six. For example, we are presently uh, studying the possibility of a county representative, whom you may, may have noticed is absent uh, from this committee. Uh, the city of San Diego would be represented, but so far there's no member of the county represented. San Diego Zinc may have a participation only for a limited period of time. The 200th anniversary committee would have a limited participation only until 1969, and they feel that their job would be done. Uh, I would assume that the Unified Port District 
and the City of San Diego and the Chamber uh, would be a continuing uh, membership on the committee, but other organizations may come in and go out uh, as, as the need fits. Uh, we're in the formative stages, Mr. Shiloh, and of course at this time that we don't know all the answers, but we're trying to bring in any and all groups who are working towards the same ends as, as we feel the committee is approaching. The reason I ask, of course, at the formative stages, the rules will be set up, and uh, as you start down the path of success, which I'm sure you will reach, uh, the people who are in here will exert their knowledge and influence, and uh, uh, I know that we are endeavoring to do something uh, uh, in the southeast San Diego area to the west of the freeway, and uh, I was wondering about the participation there, or the weight of moving it up toward Lower Broadway as against the other without the representation. Just a question runs through my mind. Well, I, I can understand that concern. Uh, the city of San Diego would be the primary participant in terms of their staff and the in inventory of available land, not San Diego and Zinc. They actually will not participate in that respect. <coughs> the, uh, I think it's partially an answer to Mr. Shadow's question. Uh, Economic Development Corporation is Become, becoming vitally concerned with the South of Broadway or the uh, 101 study, which the community itself apparently is not capable of supporting, and so possibly they will be assuming that leadership factor in that area. And if this is true, they would be represented on the committee and would represent that 101 area. It, it, it's fine to assume, and you might be, you probably are right. However, there's just the chance that you wouldn't be, and this is the concern that I would have, and I'd like to have this sort of thing spelled out because when you go into this uh, as to when new members come in, how do they come in, are they voted in by this group or not, uh, uh, what weight is uh, put to the different directions and you are going to be asking for rather substantial funding from the city when you start talking about putting our planning staff to work on this thing and our technical staff and I would, when we have the conference I would certainly like to have as much of this information available as possible. I'd be happy to meet with you in the conference any time that you see fit. Yeah. Mr. Walsh. Your Honor, I would move that uh, we refer to this uh, item of the Coordinating Committee on Oceanic Research uh, to the uh, two council conference and that the manager uh, come back at that time with a report and a recommendation in regards to city participation in this uh, group and that secondly that the planning director be approached and the manager uh, to come back with an estimate of total cost to the city and, and hours and staff that would be involved in our participation. Okay. Do so you second, Mr. Shaver? Your Honor, I think it would be quite, prop quite proper for the uh, Deputy Mayor to appoint a member of the Council to specifically be a representative with this group and that management appoint somebody from planning and management to also work especially with this group and that these people would be known to us at the time of the Council. Conference. Motion is referred to conference to determine whether we were going to participate. And at that time, I think your motion would be in order. <coughs> On the question, call roll. Thank you, Mr. Hewitt. And as soon as the material can be assembled, and Mr. Deputy Mayor will notify and we'll hold a conference on the subject. I hope shortly. Thank you very much. <coughs> On the supplemental docket, item number one was continued for the lack of eight votes for the meetings of September the 13th, October 6th. This is the paving and otherwise improving Macaulay Street there against at Chatsworth and Clove. This is an eight vote resolution of feasibility, and we have some protests. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to be heard on item one on the supplemental docket? Anyone in the audience? Yes, sir. Step up. Are you on the Macaulay Street? Uh, on Clove Street. Okay, sir, step up. Thank you for the nice guy here. The, most of us come here pretty tongue tied, I'm I am pro uh, the improvement. I live on Clove Street. Would you, you give your name and address to the William Clark. Parsons. I live at 1822 Clove Street. Oh, fuck you. Would you ask the gentleman to use the microphone? Oh. Step over in front of the mic, yes, sir. Uh, my name is uh, William Larson. I live at 1820 Clove Street. Uh, I have a property interest only. I'm not representative of any organization except for those men uh, who can't be here who do uh, think this improvement is in order. Uh, as I stated, I am for it. For those of you who are familiar, and I'm sure most of you gentlemen in the council and the mayor are familiar with the Point Loma area. Point Loma Heights was uh, subdivided around 1888. It's been there a long time. 
at one time it was considered to be a very quaint area, but it's gone beyond the days of quaintness. We need the improvements that have been recommended, and uh, I'm afraid too many of us just sit up there and forget that those who are against something usually uh, get the grease on the wheel. And in this case, uh, there are many of us who feel that the children who attend Dana Junior High School are entitled to something to walk upon except the very busy street of Macaulay. Macaulay turns into a street called Narragansett, and Narragansett has been improved for many years and goes to Chatsworth as improved streets. The sidewalk and the curbing on uh, Macaulay Street, however, was improved just a couple of years ago up to the middle of Clove Street. It was stopped at that point uh, for what reason no one really knows. But under the 1911 Improvement Act, most of us feel that we will receive uh, a fair shake insofar as the cost of this improvement, and it will prevent, perhaps, uh, sometime, I'm sure, some youngster is going to slip out into the street so that there is no boundary to keep him there. There is no curb, there is no sidewalk, and there is no way for him to know exactly where the street ends and the sidewalk begins. And for this reason, I appear this morning in the hopes that the council will remember that uh, there are too many of us who don't say anything, even though we realize the importance of it. We all feel it in our pocketbook. Our reason I'm here is because I have received my letter that say I'll be assessed. And so I feel like I'm not talking particularly against anyone, uh, since all of us are going to pay our fair share under the 1911 Improvement Act. Any opposition to this uh, uh, is primarily one I think of uh, financial rather than practical. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. Mr. Engineer, have you made an evaluation? I see we have another petition here. We have five, how many? Total 25. 25 signatures. Have you evaluated these? Um, yes, uh, it represents 28, or about 27.9 percent of the several signatures. There was only 16 property owners or actual parcels of land involved. <laughs> but uh, this represents 27.9% uh, protest. This was initiated by the district? No, well, this was a uh, city-initiated project. We were not successful in collecting the signatures? Uh, the petition was circulated, wasn't it? We, we, our field representative did contact the people. We were not able to get any signatures in favor of it at, uh, prior to the recommendation of the city engineer uh, to initiate the project. None whatsoever? And we have a gentleman here who says that there are quite a few out there that would say they're in support of it. I believe this gentleman is not actually front on the improvement. Is this correct? Uh, my property is on Cole Street, which is one of the six blocks affected on the side of the Cole, and here's a list of any notice of the improvement, but it is not front <coughs> on the Not on the front end. Right. I kid you. Okay. I, I frankly can't understand there's not one person on the frontage who you could get a signature out of? Uh, that was correct. We, we didn't get any signatures at the time. Could you try? Here. Yes, our field representative tried, yes. I'm not sure exactly uh, whether or not 100% was contacted, but an attempt was made to get signatures. And, uh, well, we have a council policy where every one of these, that every, uh, there's supposed to be an effort to contact everyone. Now, uh, it's, it's a little bit odd to me that we couldn't pick up one signature. <laughs> Better put a watch on that on those doors. It does seem strange, particularly when the protests are kind of scattered all on one side of the street and the opposite side. Uh, perhaps I should point out, this is uh, Dana Junior High School. Oh. <laughs> okay. Oh. Oh. <laughs> this guy. What were the nature of these protests, the petition which you mentioned? Is it cost or what? Read some of the headings there, Mr. Clear. It's cost and benefit. Uh, the first one is the cost of the improvement is more than I anticipated. The uh, second one is Macaulay Street looks nice the way it is, no real room for improvement. Uh, another one objected to the fact that school children will, will use this street as a sidewalk <coughs> in front of their home. <laughs> the letter with 20 signatures on the petition with 20, 20 signatures uh, states that it is our collective opinion that the proposed work and additional paving are neither necessary nor desirable, and that the present condition does not justify this change. 
What does the Board of Education say? I was going to ask the engineer whether this was initiated at their request or what. <coughs> Sounds like it might uh, It was not specifically at their request. We have been in contact with them, and they are much in favor of the improvement. Uh, the uh, the uh, initiating of the project was primarily uh, through our traffic engineer. By what? By, by the... Uh, uh, problems of uh, pedestrians, uh, school children, school children, complaints in the school board. That's what that sort of thing. Yeah. Let's go. Uh, I gathered from um, Fowler's indication that there are some markings on that map that would indicate protests, which are not visible from here. If you could give a general idea of where these are, I'd appreciate it. Can you br bring it over in front of the council? I think it's kind of hard to see those red marks. The board of Education participates in this 1911 act. They pay for their share. <coughs> Mr. Engineer, can you answer that? The Board of Education will participate in their share of the improvement. Mr. Hitch? Uh, Your Honor, uh, since Mr. Larson has received his uh, assessment, I would assume that all the affected properties have received a notice and an assessment. And since there is no one here to uh, protest this, I would assume it has uh, neighborhood acceptance. Therefore, I'd like to make the motion that the hearing be closed, that the resolution of feasibility be adopted, and the resolution ordering the work and uh, notice inviting bid be adopted. Second. And overrule the protest, Mr. Overrule the protest. There is a second. Call it off. <coughs> By a majority vote of the council. Correct? No. Error. Pardon? Vote. No, I say, is that an error or is that a correct vote? That's a correct vote, Brian. Okay. Better die. If I could speak to the, uh, to the vote. Mr. Walsh. Uh -huh. uh, I think that the position the council is being placed in in regards to the requirement for an eight vote on the feasibility is one that really requires immediate attention. Now, we've gotten a report back from the city attorney on that, and I think it's completely unfair where one individual, such as myself, who purposely, disregarding the merit of the project and so on, voted against, just to, to point out the problem that's involved here. One individual on the council with eight people here uh, can frustrate, say, the majority or seven votes or seven-eighths vote of the total council. Okay. And uh, I think that this is completely improper, and I think that unless we do something about it real quickly, that one individual, say in here where we had 30% protest, uh, where we had no one on the frontage who was willing to sign a petition and so on, uh, one individual supporting this position and everything, then can overrule the total seven uh, votes of the other individuals. I think it's completely improper, and I think that something has to be done about it quickly. That's not quite correct. The eight-vote eight resolution of feasibility in this instance the motion was made to include all. The proper motion at this time would be to split the motion, take each one separately, and go back and do it over. If the eight vote, wait a minute, split if the eight vote resolution of feasibility fails, as it would have on this vote, then it would go to the debt limitation. And it would still proceed on the base, providing the rest of it. Move right. split the motion. I want a point of information before we start splitting motions. I was on the prevailing side, right, which is the losing side. So my intention was only to prove a point, and so the point is this, that we've really got to do something on this eight vote resolution and, and pretty quickly. I would move uh, reconsideration of, the, of uh, the item on the supplemental docket. Mr. Walsh, I, I get your message real loud and clear, except I think that the, manager, or the attorney gave a report to the council just two weeks ago in relation to a positive statement that nothing could be done in relation to this. Now, Mr. Attorney, do you want to make a Add to this, or what do you want? Well, Your Honor, you'll recall that we've looked at this several times in the last year, and everybody understands and appreciates the position and the statements Mr. Walsh is making. Under state law, and the 1911 Act is a state law, you need the eight-vote resolution of feasibility if you are to avoid proceedings under the Debt Limitation Act of 1931. If you choose to go the debt limitation proceedings under the Act of 1931, you're entirely free to do so. It will add to the cost of the work. It will add three months to the procedures to do it, but you can get there. We've also pointed out to you that under the petition routine, 
where 60 percent, as I recall, uh, signed the petition, but that too got away from the Debt Limit Act. Uh, we pointed out that conservative opinion is to the effect that the petition is not to be used and that the proceeding, the eight-vote resolution, is preferable. You have your choice in that area. If you chose to if you choose to go the petition route with all the attendant hazards, which we pointed out to you, which would cast a cloud over some of these 1911 Act proceedings, you're entirely free to do so. We thought it improper. It may be that you should address your your work and your led to your legislative committee towards developing at the state level some changes in the state law on this thing. Point. My, this is the whole point. We are going to be adjourning this meeting to go in to pass on resolutions to the league which are going to be presented to the legislature, hopefully for passage. I bring this point up because, as, you, as your office did point out, Mr. Butler, that it does rest with the state and the state's control, but we find ourselves in this position, which I think one of the resolutions that we should seriously consider this morning or this afternoon is a resolution to alleviate this situation. So I would move reconsideration of, uh, of uh, item one on the supplemental docket. Mr. Shaver. Well, Your Honor, I, uh, I would hope Councilman Walsh has some strong convictions on this thing. I would be critical of him if he's just using this public uh, resolution to prove a point. I think it's a, it's a misuse of it. Now, I can't second his resolution because I was on the losing side by seven to one. Anyone can second it. Anyone can second it? I, I'm not happy to see us use just to prove a point. I think it would have been more proper for him to speak out before he voted and then vote against if that was his uh, conviction. This come. Um. For Mr. Walsh's edification, we did not finish our list this morning, and it's on the list for asking you for yeah, such a resolution. Um, I would like to ask a point of order, sir. Does the entire, all of these resolutions fail, or merely the one that required eight votes? As I said before, the motion was made to include the three, or the four items, closing the hearing, ordering the work, fighting the bids, and, that, and the resolution of feasibility. And in order to, uh, to accomplish the... Uh, from the chair's point of view. In order to accomplish this, it would have to been divided after the vote because they were voted on collectively. But you would have to be forced to go to the debt limitation in regards to the feasibility, which is not my intention. My intention is to, is to bring with emphasis upon the fact the need for action by this, by this council. And so, if, was there a second, Your Honor, on my... Yes, there is. Uh, Ms. Tom? Excuse me, I didn't understand your answer. Then the chair is ruling that all of these failed. No. Is that yes. what you're ruling? The chair is ruling that that motion failed because in it was a requirement for eight votes, and that we would the only way that you could accomplish that motion would be to go back and split it okay. and come back with individual. This would be the chair's ruling on it. Sorry, thank you. But so that's we, not what's before us. It's now a motion, motion to reconsider. reconsider. Let's vote on call call over all on reconsideration. I think not eleven. It's unanimous. Now the chair will entertain a motion. Adopt the resolution of feasibility. Thank you, Mr. Shadow, and I think it should be policy for the chair from here on in on all eight vote resolutions to call that one separately from the other three motions. Second the motion. I don't think it's been a problem up to this point, and it's quite a time saver. Uh, uh, I think the point was well made. I like the way we've been doing it just fine, but uh, on this one, why, I'm certainly agreeing with you. Okay, caller on the eight vote resolution of feasibility. Order and over the protest. Okay, that's your motion. Go. I'm asking. The all-inclusive motion of closing the hearing, overrule the protest, order the work, and invite the bid. Call a roll. Avenger. Call a roll. There will be a council executive session immediately in the council chamber, in the council meeting room. <laughs>